Hello and welcome to Tech Deals graphics card performance comparison. Today we are testing four different graphics cards. The RX 570 4GB card against the GTX 1060 3GB card. The RX 580 8GB card against the GTX 1060 6GB card. Now these cards range in price from about $170 to about $250 when I'm filming this in 2017. There will be links in the video description below to both Amazon and Newegg for all four sets of graphics cards. By all means, compare prices and buy it where it makes the most sense to you. All four cards were installed in the same computer. It's my $1,500 i7 7700K build running at a fixed 4.7 gigahertz on all four cores. Link to that build video in the video description below. Fraps was used for the frame performance numbers you will see at the end of this video, but it was not used to capture any of this video. Instead, an external Elgato HD60S hardware capture card was used plugged into a separate computer. So there is no performance loss for having captured this video. You are watching the actual video that the performance numbers at the end of the video is used for. Finally, the numbers in green at the top left corner of the screen are from MSI Afterburner, a free program you can download and use to monitor your system's performance in real time while playing games. This is a very handy tool to figure out what is the limitation to your system's performance. Is it your CPU, your RAM, your graphics card? I use this all the time. And if you want to find out what the bottleneck or limit in your system is, I recommend you do so as well. Please note that there is a full playlist linked in the video description below. I tested 17 different games on these four graphics cards. Some AMD win, some Nvidia win, most are pretty similar, but this will give you a rough idea of what to expect with these four cards in a wide variety of games in 2017 with the updated current versions of the drivers from each company. Since I've posted many of these videos, I'm going to keep this one short and sweet. This is the Sapphire ITX RX 570 single fan card. It is the least expensive, slowest clock RX 570 on the market. Most of them are going to be a little bit faster than this. The RX 580, which I'll talk more about in a second when we get to that footage, is one of the fastest RX 580s on the market. So I've bracketed or bookended the market with the slow RX 570, the fast RX 580. To give you an idea, most cards will fall in between the two in performance. If you look at the real time numbers in the upper left hand corner, you'll see we're using 3.7 gigabytes of VRAM. 100% of our GPU, we are in fact graphics card limited here. Temp fan speeds are all up there. Look at our CPU usage. If this were an i5 instead of an i7, we'd basically be getting the same performance so long as the clock speed was the same. Even if the clock speed was a little slower, we are primarily graphics card limited, not CPU limited. We'd have to have a lot more graphics card before the CPU became a limitation. Main system RAM, seven and a half gigabytes. It'll run in eight, it's smoother in 16. I've commented on this on my channel before, 16 gigs of RAM is where it's at for 2017. Finally, frame rate, looks good, doesn't it? Well, yes, it comes and it goes. You'll see it varying. It's at 97, there's 105, then it dips down to 70. It fluctuates by quite a bit depending upon what's on the screen, zoomed in, etc. Now this is multiplayer, this is not the story mode. Some parts of the story mode are worse than multiplayer. Some parts are better. It depends where in the game you're at. I gave a great deal of thought actually as to where in the game to test. Multiplayer, single player, do I test on a planet? Do I test a, in combat? Do I test in a story mission? Do I do random exploration and killing out in the desert, for example, or on the ice world? Therein lies the challenge of testing in the story is there's so many different places to test and performance frankly is all over the place in story mode. Multiplayer is a little bit more repeatable, granted the maps and the enemies are slightly different, but at least the size of the combat, what you're doing doesn't actually change all that much and it's kind of nameless and faceless and there's no cutscenes to get in the way of frame rate, so we're doing multiplayer. The other reason I'm testing multiplayer is simply because 
three months from now, six months from now, I think multiplayer is going to be where the remaining interest in this game is. People who wanted to play this game, of course, except for those who pick it up on discount in the future, will have done so closer to launch, but people may very well be playing multiplayer for years. I know the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer servers are still moderately active. I've gone on there a couple of times and played it. I was really big with the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer when it first launched. Although, to be completely frank, it did get kind of old pretty quickly. And if they don't add new modes or new maps to this, well, we'll have to see how that holds up and what the interest level is. So this has been the RX 570. Let's take a look at the GTX 1060 3 gigabyte card. Now, we are playing in ultra detail, and this is the MSI Gaming X 3 gigabyte card. This is the big black and red graphics card. Big oversized heatsink, big oversized fans, which is all, quite frankly, overkill for a GTX 1060 3 gig card. But hey, it looks nice, and it runs very cool and very quiet. Look at our temps, 62 degrees Celsius. Celsius. That is no big deal for this graphics card. 32% fan speed, 800 RPM. This thing is absolutely 100% totally silent. Frankly, sticking my head next to the computer, I can't hear it. The case fans and the liquid cooler are louder. This card has good overclocking potential. In fact, most of the factory overclock big fan cards do. The EVGA for the win, the Gigabyte G1 Gaming, this MSI Gaming X, all make very nice overclockable cards. Now, I did not overclock it. That 1936 megahertz is the auto boost that it gets from NVIDIA's GPU Boost 3. So it's actually already overclocked, but it does it automatically. You don't have to do anything. Still, with this wonderful card and this big heat sink and cooler, if you decide to get this, Open up, uh, download and install MSI Afterburner and be sure to open it up and type a plus 65 into the clock speed. It'll throw you up right to 2 gigahertz even. It's not going to have any issues running at 2 gigahertz. You may even get 2.1 out of it. You can play with it, maybe type in a plus 100, plus 115. You should be just fine. This cooler is so big and so over-engineered for a GTX 1060. I am not remotely worried about running it at anywhere in the 2 gigahertz maybe 2.1 range. I would advise you, unless you really know what you're doing, don't mess with voltage. The worst thing that will happen if you up the clock speed of the card is it will simply crash the machine. You'll, you'll simply go to black or blue screen and you'll have to reboot and then try a different setting. You will not hurt your card by running it at to a high clock speed because it has thermal protection. It will not over temp. However, voltage kills cards. If you mess with the voltage and you accidentally type in too large of a voltage, you can fry your graphics card almost immediately. My recommendation for most people, don't mess with the voltage, only mess with the clock speed. You won't hurt the card using clock speed, but voltage is what will kill it. Now take a look at our real-time performance. We are at 62, 67, 71 frames per second. It's really quite good, all things considered. But look at our VRAM usage. Now it has to be lower because we only have a three gigabyte card. Do I recommend in 2017 you buy a three gig card? Not really. I did last year, but the reason I changed my advice is two reasons. We're nine months post launch of the three gigabyte cards and the prices have dropped. There was a $60 price difference between the three and the six gig cards when they launched and now there's only a $30 difference. In fact, with mail and rebates, sometimes you can get it down to even less. The 6 gig cards are 10% faster in terms of base performance because there's more CUDA cores and they have double the VRAM. For $30, that's a deal. The only time I'd recommend the 3 gig card is if you really only play older or casual games or you simply can find an amazing deal for one for more than $30 less than the 6 gig version. So this has been the GTX 1060. How about we look at the RX 580? I really like this new RX 580. Now this card specifically, but the RX 580s in general, the price of the eight gigabyte cards has dropped dramatically. And I do recommend an eight gigabyte RX 580 at this point in 2017. Why? Because the price difference, just like the NVIDIA cards, has now dropped. There is only about a $30 price difference between the 4GB and the 8GB cards. Now, performance-wise, they're the same. There's no shader count difference between a 584GB and a 588GB. However, many of the 8 gigs are factory overclocked, and so their out-of-the-box clock speeds are higher. Although you can overclock the 4GB cards and get effectively the same thing. 
That being said, if you're prepared to spend $200 on a graphics card and we're in the middle of 2017, spend $230, get the 8 gigs of VRAM. No, you don't really need it today. It's fine. Four gigs will play absolutely everything in the market today at 1080p without any issues whatsoever, even at ultra detail. But what about next year? Are you buying a card for just one year or are you buying a card for three years? At this point with a $30 price difference, get the eight gig card. I think over three years of ownership, it will pay for itself easily. Now this is the Gigabyte Aurorus factory overclocked card, 1425 megahertz versus the base speed of 1340 of standard RX 580s. Now in terms of raw performance per dollar spent, is this card the best deal on the market? No, not really. The increase in performance is not matched by the increase in price. Or to put it more specifically, the price went up faster than the performance did. That's not why you buy this card. Yes, it's faster, but most RX 480s should overclock to 1400 megahertz if you want to manually set them there. What this card will do is it'll do 1425 at 39, 40% uh, fan speed. Many basic entry level RX 580s may take 50 or 60% fan speed to do it. So you're getting silence. This thing is a huge card two and a half slots wide. If you only have two slots available, don't get this card because it won't fit. Huge oversized heatsink, big 100 millimeter fans, RGB lighting. Hey, it's 2017 RGB everything. This has an eight pin and a six pin PCI Express power connector. To the best of my knowledge, it's the only card except for the Sapphire Nitro limited edition card, which is similar price, similar performance to this. All the other RX 580s have a single eight pin connector. This also has a six pin up to 300 watts, which is complete overkill for this card. It's never gonna pull 300 watts of power, but it simply removes all restrictions of power delivery, meaning temps and voltage are your only limits to overclocking. How's performance? Wonderful. Well, you can see the real time numbers. That's what we do these videos for. I know I could simply throw up some charts, but let's be honest, this shows you how the game really plays. This is very, very good. The responsiveness of multiplayer and Mass Effect Andromeda on all four cards is very good. Now the frame rate is much better on this than the RX 570, but the truth is, is the RX 570 is completely playable. In my opinion, with a 570, I would, however, turn the detail down to high instead of ultra. It does remove just a bit of hesitation at various busy points in the game, and it will give you a little bit more even frame rate, especially when compared to the frame rate you get on the RX 580. Look at that. We're at 110, 120 frames a second, but look how much it changes. We bounce between 110 and 120 and down to 70 at times. So it's extremely variable. If you have a 1080p 60 Hertz monitor, turn V-Sync on and you'll get a smooth solid 60 frames a second that doesn't vary, perfect performance. Well, that's enough of the RX 580. Let's take a look at the six gigabyte version of the GTX 1060. Now, as I said before, the six gigabyte version does have more actual compute resources on the card called CUDA cores. So it has about 10%, eh, give or take, more processing power than the three gigabyte card. And of course, double the VRAM. Now, when this card launched, it was $60 more, but frankly, it's now $30 more by the six gigabyte card, it's the deal. This is the EVGA for the win card. I did not recommend the For The Win card when this first came out. In fact, just a few months ago in January of 2017, I did an updated which GTX 1060 should you buy? And I specifically said, don't bother with the For The Win, waste of money, don't spend the money. What's changed? Price. This card launched at $300. It's not worth $300. Last week, this card was selling for under 230 on New Egg. That is a completely different story. In fact, when I did the voiceover of this video, there was only a $10 price difference between the single fan superclocked EVGA and the for the win dual fan EVGA. Both six gig cards, both were just over $210. For that price, sure, if you've got a computer with an 8-pin PCI Express power connector and room for the 2-fan card, get the For The Win. Now, performance-wise out of the box, it's no faster, and I demonstrated that in that video back in January. 
all of the 1060s out of the box perform the same. They all auto, auto overclock to the mid uh, 1950 megahertz range. This one is doing really well at two gigahertz even. What's interesting is the amount it overclocks varies from game to game and sometimes even load to load. If you watched my Assassin's Creed Syndicate test with these four cards, I tested it at high detail on this card and it was at 2000 megahertz even. I reloaded the game at very high detail, which does require a relaunch of the game, and it booted up at 1987 megahertz. Go figure. I find that it varies by 12 to 13 megahertz from run to run and launch to launch, but usually not much more than that. And you'll never notice that difference in the real world. That 12 or 13 megahertz out of two gigahertz is a completely trivial difference. Don't worry about it. All the other performance metrics are very nice. We're using three and a half gigs of VRAM. We're not even using 50% of our i7 CPU. So an i5 would in fact be fine, at least if it has a decent clock speed. It'll be a little slower if you've got a stock or a locked i5 in the three and a half gigahertz range. But certainly if you have an unlocked i7, it's gonna perform just as well as this. Main system RAM usage is pretty consistent across the board. Most modern AAA gaming titles in 2017 seem to use between six and a half and eight and a half gigabytes of, of main system RAM. And here we are at the results. Ultra detail, 1080p, all four cards average over 60 frames per second. The green bars are the average. The two lower end four and three gig cards, almost exactly the same performance on all three metrics. The two higher end, the eight gig and the six gig cards, also almost the same performance. Now, please note the maps were a little bit different between the runs, the enemies. It's, it's, a, it's online multiplayer, so the performance is never gonna be exact. Here's the reality of my experience of messing around with these. The two lower end cards are virtually identical in performance. The four and the three gigabyte card, very nice. Now the RX 580 looks like it's winning here. If I were to swap the maps and swap the missions and run these three more times, those numbers would shift around plus or minus a little bit. The truth is for 1080p ultra gaming, an RX 580 eight gig card or a GTX 1060 six gig card is my recommendation in 2017 for value for the money while providing a completely playable experience. The red bars and the blue bars, let me talk about those briefly. The red bars are 1% minimum and the blue bars are the 0.1% minimum. In essence, instead of a true minimum, which is just a single frame, these are a percentage minimum. These drop the lowest 1% and the lowest 0.1% of the frames and use that number as the minimum. To turn it around, the red bars represent the minimum frame rate you'll get 99% of the time, dropping the lowest 1% of frames. The blue bars represent 99.9% .9 of your gaming experience dropping the lowest 0.1% minimum, which is actually very few frames in terms of an absolute total number. So the red bars are the ones I think you should look at closely. They represent real world gaming. Your performance will average the green and will not dip below the red bars 99% of the time, which frankly across a 10 or 15 minute gaming session is a handful of seconds of gameplay total, all things considered. The two higher end cards did not drop below 60 frames per second 99% of the time, and the two lower end cards did not drop below 50 frames per second 99% of the time. Great performance, multiplayer in Mass Effect Andromeda is really well optimized. I was very happy to see these results. Like this video if you like it, share it with your friends if you loved it. Remember to subscribe to my channel with that big huge button directly below this video, questions and comments below the video, and as always, check out that video description. Links to everything mentioned in here will be down there. Links to my i7-7700K build video full playlist will be down there. Links to Amazon and Newegg will be down there. And links to my Patreon account will be down there. Do you like my channel? Do you find my in-depth analysis interesting and useful? Do you wanna see more of this? Consider becoming a Patreon, support me, and it will let me stay independent and keep making great videos for you. Even if you only have a dollar to contribute each month, it's greatly appreciated and helps more than you might think. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.